Hello and welcome to Woodshed Reviews, where we look at films old and new, good and bad. And tonight we're going to look at a classic, one of my all-time favourites, Eraserhead. Uh, this is my choice though, but it's only because I haven't actually properly seen Eraserhead. I've seen a bit of it when I was way too young and left a bit of a, an impression on me and I never wanted to go back. So you not, haven't seen it since? Uh, no, no. Uh, it's only, I think it's probably the only, it's a David Lynch film. It was his first film, yeah. Then some short first, films. First feature film, yeah. Uh, from 1977. And I think it's the only David Lynch film that I haven't seen. But the story is that I saw it when, I don't know how old I was, mum can maybe remind me. Um, I came in probably from playing in the back garden when I was quite young. Um, my dad was watching it. Okay. Uh, I caught a bit of it. I don't know if I saw it. Two minutes, 20 minutes, um, it was enough to kind of uh, give me literal nightmares for the next two nights and uh, my dad got a bit of a, a, a balkan, let's just say, from my mum <laughs> for, for having let me see that bit. So uh, yeah, it kind of gave me a genuine, genuine kind of nightmares. So uh, for that reason, um, I never went back until, and I, and I thought, oh, if I'm going to do it, why not, why not record it? Why not record my mental breakdown? <laughs> So we don't know what to expect when you come back from no, watching this. I might be a, I might be a, a shell of my former self. Um, so you've seen it, so I'm, I will kind of say what I remember about it. A man finds a baby, an alien baby, a creature of some kind, and he takes it home. And I remember he's sort of he's sort of looking after it or tending to it or something. Yeah. And then he cuts the bandages off, and some unspeakable things from what I remember kind of erupt forth. Yeah. Um, I think that was probably about the, the, the moment when I kind of quickly dashed out the room and um, was forever kind of tainted. Yeah, I mean, for you to see that at a young age, it's, it's quite nightmarish. Um, <laughs> Literally. Yeah. So is that, is that kind of, am I on something yeah. like that happen? These things happen, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's very much a film that's open to many interpretations. Um, yeah. I watch it almost every five years, I guess. Okay. Um, that's enough for me. <laughs> okay. But it's one of my all-time favourite films. Right. It's, it's a strong film. And every time I watch it, I feel like I see it something different. Mm -hmm. It's like watching it anew again. So I think it's one of these films you watch and maybe you're at a different stage in your life and it, it means something else to you. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, this is film as a work of art, in my opinion. Okay. So you, I, you would be, I would say, of the two of us, you're like the David Lynch fan. I would say I'm the David Lynch appreciator, if that okay. yeah, sure. uh, makes sense. As I've said, I've seen all his films, some maybe once or twice and some, you know, quite a few times. Yeah. So I am looking forward to seeing it. I, I'm pretty sure I'll, I'll like it um, to some degree, whether there's any sort of um, lasting kind of psychosis from <laughs> when I was like eight or ten. I, I don't know how old I was, somewhere around that ballpark. Yeah. Um, we'll wait and see. It's an experience. and um, uh -huh. So we'll go off and watch it and we'll come back and give it a dissection. A dissection? Quite. <laughs> well, from what I remember of it, that might be, yeah. <laughs> that might be the art word. Yeah, okay, let's do it. So what are we doing? Scooby-Doo so, transition or? Yeah, something like that. Or we could walk off. Just walk off. Yeah. So yeah, we'll go and watch the film now. Okay, see you later, guys. <clears throat> and we're back. You do something with your hair. Just, just wearing it up today, I thought. Okay. No reason. Cool. Suits you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So um, we're back for part two of our Razorhead review. Uh, it was a few days ago and uh, we've both watched it. I think you've watched it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was, my first watch, it was fairly ominous and I was kind of like a bit kind of geared for uh, the worst and well, maybe the worst did happen, but uh, I went back to it a couple of days later. Um, rewatched it again, um, and yep, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed this film. Really? Yeah. Let's get into Razorhead. Was well, this is a quick, uh, quick recap? I suppose nineteen seventy seven debut feature film by David Lynch, who. Um, probably better known for things like Twin Peaks, um, Blue Velvet. Yeah, um, Mulholland Drive. Mulholland Drive would be a, a more recent-ish one, although not really. It's about 20 years old now. Yeah, yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute.
You know, this is, excuse me, a damn fine cup of coffee. I think um, to, to get into why I like it, because I was prepared to kind of go, I was thinking, right, this might be just the most pretentious load of nonsense and I'm just going to say so if that's the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it wasn't for me. And I think two reasons for it. It's got a story, mm -hmm. which I wasn't quite expecting. Not that, I mean, David Lynch's films do have a story, but I thought with well, this one being his first film and the, I suppose the, the lore behind it, um, even if you haven't seen it, you kind of know stuff about it, you know, and I thought it was going to be a lot more kind of oblique and kind of, uh, I don't know, open to, well, it is open to interpretation, but it, it's also got like a, a kind of clear enough story that you could kind of um, parse to someone. There's a baby. It's at the hospital. Mom! And you're the father. But that's impossible. It, it's only Mother, been... they're still not sure it is a baby. It's premature, but there's a baby. After the two of you are married, which should be very soon, you can pick the baby up. The character, main character of Henry Spencer, I think his character is someone you can kind of maybe not relate to, is maybe not the right word, but you can understand. Yeah, he, he's got a kind of quite a calm exterior, I think. Very. Yeah. And it's, um, he's very troubled at the same time. It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of weird. In my first viewing of it, I didn't laugh and I didn't smile or anything like that. I didn't even, I don't think I cracked a right. smile or anything. The second viewing, I definitely thought that there's more comedy or more laughs, kind of, mm -hmm. in this than I first kind of realised. I thought I heard a stranger. We've got chicken tonight. Strangest damn things. They're man-made. Little damn things. Smaller than my fist. But they're new. I'm Bill. All that kind of stuff kind of um, gives it some lots of layers, mm -hmm. which I kind of like, I enjoy to get my sort of teeth into and get you thinking about what, what it's about and about the, the character. As I said, it's, it's good in any film, it's good to have a good, strong character that you can, as I said, I, 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 relate's probably the wrong word, but. Um, yeah, yeah, like I said, I, I, and you said there's so many different ways to look at this film. Yeah. It's about what you bring to it. Um, but. With David Lynch's synopsis, it's a dream about dark and troubling things. So yeah. I had that in the back of my mind. Okay. It being a dream, like the whole thing. So I thought, okay, I'll watch it from this perspective. Okay. I mean, the big thing I think people say about it is it's about fear of fatherhood or parenthood or not being ready for it. I think it's m more to it than that. That's definitely the biggest factor. But I think he's got a lot of fear about little things as well even meeting the potential in-laws yeah cutting the chicken <laughs> yeah. making small talk he's just got yeah. a lot of fear yeah he's not best prepared for for life mary usually does the carving but maybe tonight you'll do it henry all right with you of course I'd be happy to. Seems like a guy that maybe he's a factory worker. Obviously, he works in printing. We're told, and maybe his his uh, job is very routine. He just goes to work, goes back to his apartment, and that's it, really. He's someone that just sort of drifts mm -hmm. through life a, a, a lot by the look of it. Yeah. And he doesn't really. Con he doesn't. I don't know. He doesn't take. He doesn't take control of anything. He just lets things kind of happen to him for mm -hmm. for most of the film. Um, and nothing seems, to, I mean, as much as he's got like his, his anxiety, but also he just kind of goes with the flow almost. It's like, oh, I'm having a kid. Oh, the kid's horribly deformed. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he doesn't seem to be um, on the surface. Yeah. He doesn't seem to be particularly um, phased by it. Yeah, I think it's all like dream logic though, isn't it? It's kind of... Right. I think yeah. a lot of the scenes like meeting the parents, stuff stuff like that probably did happen, but this is his dream and in interpreting it. Okay. Like, so it's a mix of life events he's lived and ones he might live, and okay. it's kind of mixed yeah. together. That's the way I kind of looked at it. And um, the radiator, there's something in his room that's a kind of supply, obviously a radiator supplies warmth. And that was his kind of comfort. Yeah, we should prob probably explain that in case people haven't seen it. There's, he lives in a small 
it looks like there's one room, and then we slowly reveal over the course of the film that there, he's either imagining or there is a, la a small lady living in his radiator who sings to him. got the man in the planet at the start who seems to be sending these strange creatures uh -huh. that I take as re represented fear. It's all these little umbilical cord type. Kind of almost like, I like, like sp sperm or newborn babies kind of mixed yeah. together sort of thing. Um, so all these strange creatures keep, start landing on the, when she's, on the stage. Yeah. And she just ignores them completely. And, and if one gets in the way, she stamps on it. <laughs> to me, that was her, like, this is a, her showing what to do with fear, almost. Like, right. just be positive. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's fine. That's not what I take from it. Um, I was kind of, like, I kind of saw her as being his escape from his situation and the fact that she's stamping on, effectively, what are very similar to the... The child mm -hmm. itself. Yes, because that's the biggest fear. So it's manifested itself in this mutant child thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aye. Um, and so she kind of like symbolised a sort of escape from that or something. I'm not too sure. Why she's got massive hamster cheeks, um, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, and interesting to hear at last the original version of this song in heaven, mm -hmm. which uh, I know very well as a Pixies song, but uh, as usual, the the original as well not as usual, but often as a case, the original is the better version. That's cool. So it was nice to kind of hear it properly, and it's basically quite a simple song, isn't it? It's just one or two lyrics, is it? Yeah, one one. I think it's like one line uh, repeated kind of um, in heaven everything is good oh, everything is fine. fine yeah so I, I think that's just kind of like a mantra saying like just do your best with life and could be I think I would probably read uh, um, you know the obvious analogy of come into heaven take your own life <laughs> uh, you know. I've heard that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, everything's fine here um, I, I don't I think it's one of those things at the end where you don't quite you know it's open, again like everything like just about everything in this film mm -hmm. it's kind of open to interpretation yeah yeah um, so I think it, you, you could easily read it that way I think you could easily read it that um, yeah he does that well maybe he whether he does or he doesn't it's a it's a it's an escape option yeah. for him it's there and she is saying you know Come and see me in heaven. It'll be fine. Yeah. No, uh, no babies. No mutant babies in heaven. <laughs> and again, again, I take. It's not one of these things where I think sometimes you can kind of like discuss a film and be like, no, that person's wrong about their yeah. interpretation of it. Because what you're saying there is that's how often I see it, but right. this time I. Right. I tried something else. So you've seen it a few times though, have you? So. Yeah, like every time's different. Yeah. And I just, it just feels like a fresh film every time I watch it. I can see that because I, like I said, I watched it one day, then watched it, I think the day after, mm -hmm. partly for, for doing this, but um, it didn't feel like a chore at all. Yeah. Um, and it was good to kind of watch it. I think my second viewing was my proper viewing, I guess, mm -hmm. um, where you're picking up a bit more of it, like I said, about some of the more kind of humorous aspects of it some of the more kind of the, the motifs and things. Yeah. Um, you know, the first time if you'd asked me about the man and the planet, is that his name? Yeah. I would have just been like, I don't know. <laughs> but um, I've got some ideas about what what he is, um, um, you know, pulling the levers of Henry's kind of life until the gears grind and stop and 
what happens to Henry then? Well, the, this guy's the man and planet's defeated, isn't he? he? And his planet, you see, is the planet explored at the end. All oh, right, okay, that's an, yeah, okay. I didn't, I didn't pick up on that. Yeah. So g good triumphs over evil. All oh, right, okay. He lives happily ever after. Well, you've been, you've, you've changed tune. You've been more positive than normal. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> It's just because uh, Catherine Coulson, she thought it was a simple love story, so I thought, okay. Watch it from that perspective. Yeah, I never watched it from that perspective before. And, yeah, okay. Um, it's a strange one to watch it from. I can't stand it, I'm going home! What are you talking about? I can't even sleep, I'm losing my mind! You're on vacation now, you can take care of it for a night! Well, you'll come back tomorrow. All I need is a decent night's sleep. And so you had all these different creatures, the ones that land on the stage, uh -huh. the mutant baby, and then he had this little thing in his pocket uh, that he puts into a cupboard. Yeah, it's like a little worm or something. I think, for me this time, it was related to the, the girl across the hall. Okay, well, I haven't spoken about her, so there's a woman that stays across the hall. Yeah. Sort of... Did he fantasise about her? I think so. So, in reality, maybe there is a woman across the hall and he's just fantasising yeah. about her, or maybe he's, they've had something going on, or maybe not, I don't know. Mm. But to me, she's like a fantasy figure. Yeah, um, another bit of escape, I suppose. Yeah, and he's kind of... And it rep it's represented by this little creature. He opens the cupboard and, and it dances about. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't know what to make of that, so I'll listen to what you... I've got nothing to bring to the table with this yeah. one, so... Yeah, because we see them... I think she comes into the apartment, don't they? Yeah, his wife uh, leaves at one point because she can't deal with the child. And then there's that scene... I uh, uh, skipped ahead a bit when he opens the door and sees the girl across the hall and she's not this fantasy figure anymore because she's with a guy and... Yeah, they've had a they've had a, a night together yeah. at this point, and then he's kind of going back for more. It seems to be um, he's like knocked on her door previously, but uh, she's not there. And then she's with someone else, but then turns around and she sees him in a slightly disturb. She sees Henry, yeah, in a disturbing way. I've got an idea about what that is, but I wonder what your thought was. My thought is this is the reality of what she is. Like she's maybe uh, a call girl or something. And he's just realised it, and she's with this creepy guy. Mm. And um, so his fantasy of her, basically every scene with her before that was kind of like him fantasising about her. Yeah. Um, and he's just realised, all right, it's not going to work out. Yeah, it's not what I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. she's not who I thought she was. But then she turns around and sees, she sees the baby's head in place of... Henry's head for a split second and recoils yeah. in horror. Um, yeah, I kind of wondered if that was something to do with what Henry carries within him, which yeah. is, um, brought forth this child and she sort of senses it in a way, in a sort of oh, okay. feminine kind of um, way that people, I mean, there's no, I don't know if there's any sort of science behind it, but like people can kind of like be attracted to people because they know that they're going to, you know, be good at procreating, if you like. That's an interesting way to look at, at it. Again, I mean, I was coming from a different angle, and I thought, mm. this is how Henry sees himself, and he thinks, oh, okay, yeah. This is how people see him. Um, I did like, because I had no idea why it was called the razor head, uh, when we went to watch, when I went to watch it, so I did find it quite humorous. That it's basically, and I believe it was this was the kernel of the idea that David Lynch came up with when he had this daydream himself. Um, Henry's head pops up, pops off his shoulders, rolls onto the floor, is replaced by the baby's head, or a huge version of the yeah. baby's head. His head then falls through the floor into the sort of like uh, this industrialized landscape where we'd seen him. Previously, um, his head's just kind of lying there. A child picks it up, takes it to what turns out to be a pencil factory, and a sort of sample of Henry's head is taken, used to make 
um, the erasers, or rubbers as we would have said, um, on the end of the pencils. Um, and it turns out that Henry's head makes, makes good erasers. Um, so uh, I did like that sequence. It brings nothing to the film, doesn't change the narrative at all, um, and is over with. And then we're back to well, we're back to Henry in his um, in his apartment. So it seems to be another dream within a dream sequence. Um, but I did like that um, aspect. Oh, that's why it's called a razor head. Yeah, <laughs> I found out at last. I think it's about him kind of. Feeling that that's all he's worth. Yeah, yeah. What's within me worth? What's my mind worth? And it's like, uh, I'd be used for uh, the rubber tip of a pencil, basically. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, this film's uh, uh, it's up my street. Like, uh, I like this. I like it's it, it's surreal and it's weird and it's disturbing, but it's got a story. It's got a characters. It's got a sense of humor. Um, all these things kind of combined into uh, into a nice kind of tight package as well. I think we haven't spoken about the. The sound. Yeah, I was just about to mention that. Yeah, the sound design's just incredible, yeah. Something that people talk about a lot and they spent a year doing that. Mm. Very kind of industrial humming and gears and distant rumbling and white noise. Yeah. Kind of almost, not quite constant, but certainly when it stops, you notice it. And when he goes to visit uh, Mary and she's at the window, mm. uh, that's one of my favourite shots, just her out at the window uh, watching him come to the house. Yeah, that's a great scene as well. I think we've probably mentioned that a, a bit. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love the dad in it. Yeah, uh, I love it. The conversation at the table is good, isn't it? <clears throat> Very awkward. And Yeah, it's, it's that sort of thing where Henry doesn't even know how to... I mean, he's just making small talk. that You're just expected to make small talk back. And he can't even do that. Yeah, <laughs> he's just uh, what's it's, he says something like, uh, "Well, what do you know, Henry?" or something like that. And he's just like completely bamboozled. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like it's not a trick question. <laughs> well, Henry, what do you know? Oh. I don't know much of anything. What about the ending? So, I mean... I guess we need to talk about the ending. Yeah, so he's trying to help the baby out initially, and he is taking some measures, and he is actually stepping up to the plate a little bit as a dad. I yeah. think before that he's been a little lackadaisical, to be yeah, to be fair. But, um, yeah, no, he's sort of, like, left on his own devices, and he's kind of, you know, he's making a go of it. But I think once everything kind of, like, starts to go wrong around that, and he realises that, he's being sort of shackled by um, his situation. Yeah. He decides to take matters into his own hands yeah. once and for all. Um, gets a pair of surgical scissors mm -hmm. from his drawer. The baby, I think, um, wrapped is wrapped bandage. in bandages the whole time. And so he decides more out of, I, I, I took it not to be malicious more out of some sort of frustration and some sort of inquisitive nature to see what's under the bandages. Yeah, it's like, it's like what's this all about? Yeah. To... So he starts to cut the bandages off. And then, much to my childhood nightmares, we discover that the bandages are either keeping this creature together or the bandages are actually part of its physiology. Yeah. It's... Not quite clear which. Either way, it's re remarkably disturbing. <laughs> yes, either way. And I think we need to kind of like um, talk about how, what a fantastic um, prop. I know, and he's never revealed how this it was is... made, so that's even scarier. <laughs> It 
it's incredible um, just watching this from 1977 on such a small budget it must have been Hmm. And this is like a really great kind of um, creature effect. It is. It's superb. Um, <laughs> it's too real. Yeah, it, 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 it feels like there's something that we don't want to know about how that was made. Yeah. Yeah, he, and it gets even worse when he cuts it open, so the bandages come open and uh, we see inside. And then he does, I'm afraid Henry does get a little bit, um, goes over the score at this point mm -hmm. by then further kind of, Prodding it. Prodding it into yeah. its, what I guess is part of its, um, uh, some major organ yeah. that the, it has, which then everything yeah. goes. It's ruptured and, um, yeah, it's pretty gross. And yeah, we're going to go to bright light, and then Henry is with the lady in the radiator. Yeah. Um, and they have a little hug. Yeah. And then we cut, we fade to white. Yeah. Then to black. Mm -hmm. So maybe he's defeated his fears and embraced the light. Maybe. Maybe he's, <laughs> maybe he's uh, killed his child and then himself. <laughs> um, either way, <laughs> good film. <laughs> Covered, covered the razor head pretty well. Yeah, as much as we can. Yeah, um, we're gonna give it a rating. If can we get, can we rate a razor head? Yeah, we can. I guess. I mean, it's uh, it's an obvious rating for me. It, yeah, it's uh, all the logs in it. <laughs> all the log ladies. Um, yeah, so five logs for you. Yeah. I'm gonna go four and a half logs. Really? Yeah, I'm gonna go four and a half. Um, I think that's a pretty pretty good rating for it. Would I recommend it to viewers? No, <laughs> no, not at all. Depends if you're watching, what depends what they're into. Right? If you're watching this, I'm not going to recommend a Razorhead to you. As much as I love it, it's a very, very, it's a niche within a niche kind of film. I think um, it's it's not for not for everybody. No, let's put it that way. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's us for, for today. My razor head done and dusted. Uh, hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time. See ya.